people that uh, that built mounds like this, and they did it for several reasons. Sometimes they did it for burial, but a lot of times they did it as part of a ceremony. Like in our culture, the chief would always live on the highest place of the land because it was symbolic that he was watching over his people. We have what they call a medicine wheel, and it's created in the four directions, and it represents the four races of man, basically. You've got uh, red, white, uh, black, and yellow, which represents uh, like you got the, the Native Americans are red, you got the uh, African Americans that are black, and you got the Caucasians that are white, and you got the Chinese that consider yellow. And that's what represents the medicine wheel that we're all together. And that's what we've done here. Now, this one is going to be a medicine wheel garden. So we're going to. We don't go by blood quantum. And so, since we don't go by blood quantum, there's a lot of different tribal folks within the tribe that are from different nations, like you got Cherokee, Choctaw. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different people. We, we invite, uh, our main thing is education and art, but getting to that, we're Bear Clan. You know, Betty, she might be from a different clan. And it's just like what I was telling earlier, back then, they traced their, their families back through their mother's clan, not the, like we do through our dad's last name. Everything down, it gets really hot in here. And that's what I call it a hot house or a greenhouse. Can you put the fan on, please? <laughs> we got the sides open, we don't need the fan. My dad did a lot of carving, my dad and uncle, and these are a lot of the carving tools. You can see how they carved the handles and stuff, and they made their own tools out of old knives, old files. Most of this stuff is, is made by our tribal folks, and that's why we teach. What we do is about education and art. It's very important to learn as much as you can and to express yourself through art. And when they're making arrowheads, they break off little bits of rock, and that's like a pile. Like if he's sitting there making arrowheads, that's his tools that he uses. Funny looking bird, and what that does, that was made to teach something. Uh, the bird itself, see how it looks all funny and not like not, something, nothing that's normal? What happens is if we pollute our waters, we pollute their, where they live and where they eat, that's actually not, that's not really a peace pipe. That would be something somebody would smoke with a, um, like just tobacco or smoking with somebody. But when they're in pieces, see these are in two different pieces, this is truly a peace pipe. And what, they, what it symbolizes is when you get ready to do the ceremony, you put it together. It's like I'm joining you. My name's uh, Sandra Sunfeather Lee, and I'm in charge of the gift shop and all the artisans, from the pine needle basketry to gourds to carving sticks, anything you want to know how to make that has to do with American Indians. Between everyone in our tribe, somebody knows how to make it. Me, I know a lot more about the stones that I make jewelry out of because when I was a young girl, Red Jasper was the first one that I was introduced to as a child. And I was taught to drink. You would take the Red Jasper out in a bowl of water in the sun and let it, the sun the minerals drain from the red jasper into the water, and you would drink that for stomach aches or anything else. And I grew up knowing that stuff, but we didn't know it as Indian medicine. That was just medicine to us. And I love coming up here and just doing crafts and working with our chief and doing whatever we need to do. We do events outside of the museum as well, and we just enjoy doing it.
this uh, gourd bowl here was made by a friend of mine. We have several in there that we that both of us make the gourd bowls and she made this one but hers was easier for me to reach than mine was <laughs> but anyway she does a really good job the butterfly is beautiful and it has horse hair around the top so it's a nice little bowl for just about just sit around just for even to just talk about people are going to ask you questions about it here is a bowl with a lid sometimes we say the top make lids and sometimes we just do the bowl okay then like the pine needle basket like i said it's made from pine needles we pick up around here in pensacola and then we do raffia to join them together and we'll be glad to teach anybody how to make that that wants to learn to make it i added a few little beads here just to brighten it up a little and add a little to it okay this is a a gourd rattle that I made. It has a peleated woodpecker on it and we've just put it in a frame so that we can display it and uh, like I said anytime we'll be glad to teach how to make these things. We do it all the time. Just to talk a little about our tribe. I've been in the tribe for seven years now. When I first joined the tribe Miko Bobby Johns was our chief. He passed away just recently a few weeks ago and when I came here, it was just the two of us trying to set this place up and, and make a nice museum here. And we did a lot of shopping and a lot of planning and a lot of hanging stuff on the walls and all that stuff. And we had a good time doing it. My family comes from Upper Alabama. We're Upper Creeks. There are Lower Creeks and Upper Creeks. And the Lower Creeks mainly wanted to blend in with the white people. So they kind of got modernized and, and married into white people and all this stuff. The Upper Creeks kind of wanted to keep it keep the white people out but so the upper creek and lower creeks actually fought each other for a while over that but finally they all kind of succumbed they didn't have a whole lot of choice but my family came from upper alabama my grandmother is choctaw creek and scottish and yes that did make a, a pretty mean combination there but anyway my grandfather was creek and um, english we've traced him back to the shoemaker for the king of england way back there and then they married into the creeks um all i can say is those creek women must have been really pretty because all those men from overseas just wanted to marry an indian girl but anyway um we had 400 acres up in northern alabama that was gifted that was um, given to our family by the government after the Trail of Tears. That's where our family went and hid in Alabama during the Trail of Tears to keep from going to the reservation. And so when, after it was all over, the government deeded the 400 acres to my great-great-grandfather. And then they actually for the purpose of having a creek village there and they did that they had a school and everything right there on the 400 acres all the family lived there raised their children there they had the school there when they moved the school away from the from the land up to the nearest city then my grandmother's father uh, bought the old schoolhouse and raised his family there in that house. It was a dirt floor log cabin. That's where my grandmother was raised. Then when she got married, she and my grandfather moved up the hill from there and built their own house. And when we went to Alabama to visit, we would go and visit the old house where my grandmother, where my dad grew up. And when we walked down the old dirt road, my grandmother would point off into the woods and say, that's where I grew up. It was falling down by then, there wasn't much left. Now you can find one, one log out, outlining the cabin now. And like I said, it was a dirt floor. So, but she always told me that's where I lived. And so I went up and we went up and visited the land with my dad. And it's just so spiritual to go back up there and visit our native land and our family land and, and just see it still just like it was then. This is what we call a trade cloth dress. Okay, the Native American Indians made this out of the, and these go with it. This is, uh, this is our little leggings that go under it because the Native American women were not allowed to show their ankles or their elbows. So the, so the sleeves had to be below the elbow and the dress or leggings had to go down and cover the ankles. 
but this was a trade cloth dress and the women would make this out of the they call it trade cloth because they made it out of the materials that they traded the white man for the white man would bring the materials in from overseas and the native americans would trade their jewelry and their and their their crafts and all that stuff for the material so that they could make them some clothes instead of having to wear leather all the time and so this was trade cloth and they called it that because of that reason also this was the one the dress that they would wear when they went into the to the white man's towns and trade with them so they would wear these dresses in there to trade we have one called a camp skirt and it has three tiers it has to have three tiers to be traditional in the skirt you know it has one, two, three layers, three, not layers, but tiers that join together. And in that one, we use that one. We call it the camp skirt because that's the one we wore around the camp at night with a shirt that with ribbon on it on the, over the shoulders. And that was what we call our camp skirt because we wore it around the camp at night and we, during the day when we're working and stuff like that because leather gets kind of hot in Florida. So we learned how to make them out of cloth. And then we have one called a tear dress, which is really not, exactly traditional that's more like that's more of a cherokee style but it was actually made for the the first native american miss america hmm. and they made that dress and designed it for her to wear for the competitions and that was her formal dress so it was called the tear dress and they got the name from the trail of tears of course and then they have a shirt we call a ribbon shirt and robert has a couple of those in his room but we can't get in there right now uh, the ribbon shirt for the men generally had long sleeves with a cuff. It had a round neck and just a V opening here. <clears throat> and then it had ribbons hanging over the shoulders and hanging down from the, they'd come sew down to right here and then they'd hang down from there. Some of them hang over the shoulders onto the arms. But the men, that was their ribbon shirt. And then they usually, these days, more often than the leather and the breech cloth more often they wear jeans and a and a ribbon shirt with the jeans for regalia unless it's at a powwow and then they go traditional and they get we call it uh full regalia where they put everything on like their leathers and all that that'll be for powwows now but generally they'll wear jeans and a, and a ribbon shirt now so one of our favorite stories is the story of, of alligator shoes. There was this little Indian boy one time who lived down in South Florida, and there's a lot of alligators around down there. And so one day he decided his moccasins had holes all in them, and he needed some new shoes. So he thought he'd get him some alligator shoes like those rich boys wear to school all the time. So he got up one morning, and he started walking down along the river, and as he went along the river, he saw all kinds of alligators. There were big ones and little ones and green ones and gray ones. You know, as they get older, they get gray like me, you know. They start out green when they're little. And so he found all kinds of alligators up and down that river. And finally, he found this one that he thought was perfect for him. And he said, okay, that's my alligator. So he grabbed that alligator by the tail and when he did that alligator jerked him into the river and he jerked the alligator back out. The alligator jerked him right back in again. The little boy jerked him back out again. And after a little while, they were both so tired of going in and out of the river, they just kind of both plopped down on the riverside. And the little boy just <laughs> caught his breath. <sighs> oh, he's worn out. And then he looked over there and the alligator's laying over there just a little ways away from him. He said, okay, he's tired now, I got him now. So he went over there, grabbed that alligator, flipped him over upside down, and you know that alligator didn't have one shoe on? <laughs> Billy White Fox was one of our major, he, he actually won the Grammy Award, or they call it the, uh, Mammy Award or something like that. Anyway, he was our number one Native American flute player for two years ago. And he makes flutes and he teaches how to play the flute. And he told me, I bought one of his flutes and he told me when I bought it from him, he said, let your heart sing through your flute. He said, don't try to, don't try to play something somebody has written down or somebody else's music. He said, let your heart play, sing through your flute. And I had a Native American elder teach me how to make bamboo flutes, and he told me the same thing. He said, 
play your own music. He said, just play your heart through your flute. So that's what I do. None of my songs are written down. They're very seldom the same song except for Amazing Grace. And our chief's favorite song actually happened to be Amazing Grace. Now he told us that on the Trail of Tears, they actually sang Amazing Grace. And it just, it was his favorite song. And every time I, I played the flute, he had request Amazing Grace. And then he asked me, would I please play it for him when he passed away and we had his funeral. We're having a memorial service for him coming up and I'll be playing it for him then. But I came out here and played it for him right after he passed away. And it was just very emotional, but I love it. I'll play that first and then I'm going to play a regular, a, a, just a native tune for you. Okay. Yeah. That was for the chief.